going to talk about GraphQL. Uh, before I get started, though, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Pizza Panther on Twitter and on the Slack, so you can find me there. And also, uh, currently, I'm an instructor at Digital Crafts in Houston, so if anyone's looking to learn some coding, uh, come to me after the talk. Um, we, have a Pyth we teach Python and JavaScript. So. All right, let's talk a little bit about GraphQL. Uh, first of all, uh, what is it? So this is kind of the official uh, definition from the site. It's a query language for APIs and a runtime for filling those queries. And you can read the rest of it. Um, but let's kind of go over you know, what I think it is. Um, it's just you know, it's a new method for writing APIs. It's come out of Facebook. So, you know, right now, a lot of you probably are writing REST APIs if you're doing web development. GraphQL is an alternative to writing APIs. And instead of, you know, having endpoints and verbs, you have one endpoint and you kind of describe all your data and you can then access all of your data from that endpoint. So that's where the, the graph term is actually a little confusing because it doesn't mean like you're graphing or like matplotlib or anything like that. It means graphing in terms of you're making a graph of your data. Uh, think of it like a, a network graph where you have nodes and then the nodes connect to each other and those are the edges. So think of you're, getting, you're describing all your data and then you're showing how all that data connects to each other. So it's more of like a data graph. And some of the benefits that come out of this system um, that you'll see is it reduces kind of your development effort, and I'll go over you know why that happens. Um, it also can possibly reduce your bandwidth. So when you make an API call, a lot of times you know you write your APIs and you maybe stuff all the data that you're ever going to need into that endpoint. Well, what if you only need like half that data sometimes, or you know, a third of that data? So instead of just stuffing all the data, you can ask for exactly what you want, and you know, just get back what you want. Um, another benefit is you can kind of lump multiple requests together. So again, instead of having you know, if you have several APIs for different datas, different pieces of data. You can just say, hey, I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that. And you can lump it all together in one request and get everything returned at once. And uh, an alternative is actually, uh, so this GraphQL comes from Facebook. Uh, Falcor is an alternative, which comes from Netflix. Uh, the cool thing, though, um, with GraphQL is so Falcor kind of, they implemented it in JavaScript. And I actually haven't checked it recently. You haven't really seen it grow kind of past that, where with GraphQL is basically like a spec. And they said, you know, Facebook says, this is how you should do it. This is how GraphQL should be made. And then other people have gone and implemented it in other languages, not just in JavaScript. So kind of to go over the benefits of, you know, or kind of maybe try to convince you of why you would want to use GraphQL a little bit more here. So, you know, typical API life cycle, if you've ever been on like a web team where there's like a front end team and a back end team, is you have your back end team, they develop the API, your front end team says, hey, that's great, but it doesn't exactly meet our needs, so then they throw it back to the back end team. Okay, so that's cool, they modify the API, but then the requirements change on the front end, and so then you gotta throw it back to your back end team, and if you ever like worked on those Two types of teams, you're always like kind of throwing stuff back and forth. You know, I need this, go build it. Oh, now it's changed and I need to, you know, something else today. So instead, like I mentioned, we're going to, you know, map all our data out, develop an API for it, and then our front end can pick at any point which piece of data they want. It's not, you know, kind of predetermined by that API endpoint. They can query it and just get what they want, follow whatever relationships they want. And you know, there are there is still some kind of, of that back and forth that may happen, but it definitely gets reduced uh, because you just map out your data and then you request what data you want. All right, so how we do this in Python is the Graphene project. And here's the site for that. 
And you can use it in just normal Python, but if you kind of go down here at the bottom, there's all kinds of implementations for different frameworks. There's a Django implementation, SQL Alchemy, Google App Engine. I believe someone's working on a Flask implementation, and I believe there might even be another one. Um, so there's all kinds of different implementations. But you know, if you wanted to just hook it into kind of any Python framework, you could use just graphene alone or one of the additional plugins. All right. So this is an example that I've uh, pulled out of one of my apps that I did. And just to kind of show you the app so you can kind of get an idea of what kind of data. It's a quiz app that works uh, through uh, Google Assistant. And you can see you get a quiz, right, or what I call a deck. And then, you know, each deck has questions and answers. Right, and so you have that deck, and then the cards are related to that deck. So if you ever done a Django app, right? Normally you have like a models.py that describes your data. Well, now in addition to write your API, it's really simple, and this is a simplified example. But you're just going to describe your schema. You're going to describe what data you want to publicize in your API, and then the API gets generated for you, and that's it. So you can see right down here, here's my deck. You know, that's using my deck model. I'm setting up that schema. And then you can see here's my card model. So each of the questions in the quiz. And I'm saying that uses the card model. And I want to have some filter fields. And you hook that all up to your schema. So I'm going to hook up the deck and the cards. And that will generate the API for you. And you get a nice little tool. And I'm going to bring that up here. Now you have your whole API. And you can just use GraphQL. So this is the query language part of it to just query and pull out the data that you want. So let's pull out some data here. You get uh, automatic documentation. So you can see. Here is, and I have a bunch of other data on this app, but you can see there's the all cards, and here's the information on the cards that I can pull out. But let's try this out first. So you can say, okay, I want to make a query. I want to get a deck. And I guess I'll pull, let me limit that a little bit so I don't kill my database here and pull out all my cards. I'll get the first 10. All right. So this is where the kind of nodes and edges comes into play, right? This is some kind of terminology that you'll have to add into there, into your queries. But now, so I have a list of decks. OK, what kind of information can I get in my deck? OK, you have an ID. I have a slug, right? So this is the information that the front end can decide hey, for this particular view, I need the ID and the slug, and let's get the description. And also, I want to pull out all the cards. And so I'm going to get a list of all the cards for that particular quiz set. And I'll get the answer, and I think I have a question field. Yep. So the front end now doesn't have to ask the back end team for an API for just this data. I can decide what data I want to pull out for what particular view that I'm using it for. And you can see I can hit that. And there you go. There's all my data. Or you know, let's say I wanted to make some kind of front end application. You know, If I wanted to add on to that, say, uh, let's see, I think I have a card count. I decided you know, I needed a card count all of a sudden on my front end. I don't have to go talk to the back end team now to say, hey, add card count to the API for me. I just request that data, and now I can make an AJAX request, and it gives me that data. So let's do a little, another little example here. We'll uh, get a little closer to home here. So Pi Texas, guess what? I put a GraphQL on that. 
So let's pull out some of the data for that. So we have a query. Um, what kind of stuff do we have on that query? I could list out all the rooms, all the conferences. Uh, let's do the conferences. I'm going to filter it by slug. So the slug for this year is 2017. And anytime you got to have a list of stuff, you got to use that edges and node kind of uh, way of pulling stuff out. And I think we have a name. All right, so we have, there we go. We got one conference in the database with the 2017 slug. Let's say I wanted to get it out. You know, so also on my view, I want all the conferences, but I also want to get a list of all the rooms. Again, right, instead of making multiple queries, I just put them all together in one and say, you know what, let's, let's do the sponsors because they're awesome. And hold on, we won't shame anyone. We'll only do the active sponsors. And we'll pull out all those. And I think that has a name, a description, and a URL. Sure. So there you go. I have all my conferences pulled out of the database. And I have all of the sponsors put now pulled out. And you can see that you know, if you go on the PyTexas website. Nope, not the Slack. So that all, all the data that's filled in, you know, the keynotes. If I were to put that in, right, we have a query for, oh, that's the wrong window here. There you go. We could list out all the keynotes. That's a query that we included. And then all the sponsors, which we did, which were down here. So there's a, let's see, back to the slides here. Uh, there's also some more demos here that you can go look around. Uh, one of the cool ones, I put this in here. I think this is like a film database. So you can go in here. You could go in, query films, query, you know, the people in the films. Uh, I think it's sci-fi films, so that's why there's all species. Um, another good example, kind of from the web, is GitHub. So if you ever go to the GitHub REST documentation, right, there's kind of like just a million endpoints, and you got to memorize like what all those endpoints do and which endpoint has which information. Instead, you could use their new GraphQL um, endpoint and just come in here and kind of just play around with the data, see what you want to extract, you know, kind of walk your way through the relationships and just get the data you need. So there's a couple real-world examples out there for you. All right, so you're probably thinking this is the best thing since sliced bread. Like, I mean, I'm going to go use it tomorrow, right? I'm going to make all my web uh, applications GraphQL. So, you know, I always really like it in tech talks when they kind of give you some of the drawbacks. So I'm going to go over some of the drawbacks here. Because, you know, you probably still want to use your REST APIs um, in addition to this. So, you know, one of the drawbacks I found is that it is harder to cache. So, you know, everything, every request that you make goes through that URL wherever you have this GraphQL endpoint. And you can see, right, it's just sending that big blob of query string through that endpoint. So that can be kind of harder to cache. There's ways to do it, but you know, caching REST APIs is really easy because it's just a URL and you, know, you cache that URL and you're done. So I found that a little harder. Um, one kind of weird thing about the graphene implementation that I found that maybe it's a little unpythonic is that a lot of times it just like it eats errors, so like things fail and it just still returns you like data. So that's kind of concerning. I don't know if that will change. I don't know if that's like part of the graph QL spec or if that's just like something they implemented. Um, also, it is a newer project, potential source of bugs. Actually, I haven't found a lot of bugs in it, so it's a pretty, you know, pretty uh, solid project. But probably the bigger thing is, you know, it's not going to have like everything you need right now, right? It's the graphene, graphene projects, I think, is like two years old. So it's getting a little bit more, more mature. But you know some things might be hard in it 
to do still when you compare it to like a REST API um, uh, framework, like Django REST framework, let's say. But overall, you know, it can help reduce some development time and also kind of reduce that like back and forth uh, between a front end and a back end team. So any questions? How mature is the access control patterns? They're there. But those are some of the newer things that uh, that have been added um, recently. So, but I've I've found ways to work around some of it. So, and I've also contributed to the project for the things that I want it, and they pretty much accept stuff pretty fast. So, but you may have to write a little something extra. Yeah. So, any other questions back there? <laughs> ah, yes, you did. You 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 caught me. So everything, yeah, everything I showed has been a read API, which I would say that's probably what's optimal for GraphQL. Um, the way you do, let's see, I know I have it somewhere. The way you do writes is what's called a mutation. So let's see, I didn't show any of those off, but I found like the mutations don't necessarily save you too much time compared to like a REST API, but you know they work well. So the the read I find is what kind of saves you a lot of time in terms of development. Um, I haven't used those, but. I mean, the auto documentation feature is pretty cool, but I know you can do that, I think, with some of those, right? Um, but the cool thing is, right, is that, like, basically the autocomplete, you know, you can kind of go through and just figure stuff out. I really like that. Um, but and all GraphQL implementations will work the same way, so you just query it. You know, it's like learning SQL. Now you can go work with MySQL or Postgres, right? It doesn't matter too much, so... So they have that. Um, it's in graphene. I guess in particular in the Django, you can basically customize. So this is kind of the pattern I've used. Uh, let's see. So basically, any of the fields you have, you get, zoom in here, a method called resolve whatever. You know, you call that field, and you could put some kind of custom, OK, like, filter based on the user, or you can see in this example it's filtering for what's published at the time. So yeah, all that's supported. And you can have, um, you know, check for permissions, stuff like that. Um, you can add that all in also. Again, some of that, little, some of that is a little bit newer though, but it's in there now. All right, one more question, anyone? You were first back there in the back, so we'll go with you. Uh, no, so graphene is just the general uh, project for just any Python. So if you really wanted to, I've seen some crazy situations where people even put this in front of an API, like a REST API. So you can really map that to anything. But there is a Django project. There's an SQL Alchemy. Like I said, I think there's a Flask. Um, and also, too, I should I should mention um, they just released Graphene just released um, for JavaScript, so they have a JavaScript node backend now too. So um, that's the cool thing about GraphQL; is it's just a spec, so you can use it in PHP, JavaScript, Python, and uh, there's all kinds of implementations of it. All right.